Good evening. My name is Melissa Giller. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here with us tonight. Um, for those of you who also joined us uh, for the live broadcast, thank you for spending your day with us. In honor of the men and women who defend our freedom around the world, would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. In September of 2011, Rick Santorum joined seven other Republican presidential candidates and stood on a stage in an Air Force One pavilion to debate the issues. When asked about being in the public sector, Senator Santorum said, I think what people are looking for is someone to get something done. And that's what I have a track record of doing in Washington, D.C., across the board. Not just on economics, but on moral cultural issues, on national security issues, and national defense issues. And Mr. Santorum has continued in this path. In June of 2012, he and his wife Karen launched Patriot Voices, a grassroots and online community of Americans committed to promoting faith, family, freedom, and opportunity. Today he's here to discuss his latest book, Blue Collar Conservatives, Recommitting to an America That Works, which provides a game plan for Republicans to bounce back, regain popularity, and return to the party's original values. Although I think he might also like to talk about the penguins. He was watching OT in there and I didn't know if he'd come out of the <laughs> green room. He'll be joined on stage today by Hugh Hewitt, who, among other things, is a lawyer, law professor, and broadcast journalist, whose nationally syndicated radio show is heard in more than 120 cities across the United States every weekday afternoon, including locally on KRLA 870's The Answer. In addition to asking his own questions to Senator Santorum tonight, Mr. Hewitt will be asking some of the questions that you submitted when you checked in for today's event. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to introduce Hugh Hewitt and Rick Santorum. Thank you, Melissa. It is indeed a, uh, a great honor to be here with Senator Santorum. He and I are going on a tour of three different states together. I'm going to be in the great state of Ohio with him next week in Columbus, home of the Ohio State Buckeyes, which routinely thrash his Nittany Lions. <laughs> then we're going to San Antonio, Texas, which is neutral ground because we both beat the, uh, what are they, the Longhorns. Senator Santorum, uh, first question from me. Uh, Blue Collar Conservatives is a counterintuitive title. Nobody thinks of Republicans as blue collar. Why are they uh, wrong, in your opinion, to dismiss that? <clears throat> well, I think it, it, it really goes to the heart of the division in America today. Um, you know, I, during the campaign, I talked about how, really, if you look at America, it's, it's whether you believe America should be the product of the American Revolution, which is a, based on the Declaration and the Constitution. Uh, I always say the Constitution is the the how of America, how the government works. But the Declaration is really the heart and soul of America. And of course, that phrase in the Declaration, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, makes us different than any other country in the history of the world. Rights come from God. And that, that's, that's something that's sort of glossed over, but it's essential because that means if you have God-given rights, then, then the government's job is really to protect those rights as opposed to assign rights. Whereas in the French Revolution, which is the other revolution that occurred at that time, was a revolution that was about equality, which sounds like the American Revolution, liberty, which sounds like the American Revolution, and the third was fraternity, which isn't unlike the American Revolution completely because the American Revolution is about paternity, God-given rights, not fraternity, brotherhood, people giving rights. And it was explicitly a secular revolution anti-clerical, secular revolution that said that the government is in charge. It led to the reign of terror, the execution, the guillotine, Bonaparte, and now Europe, which is a descendant of the French Revolution, is a godless, secular continent, as the European Union is. And it's a dying culture. It's a culture that is shrinking from every challenge that, is, that, that, is, that has come to it. Whereas the American Revolution spawned this 
hopeful, optimistic country because we believe in the dignity of every, every human li life and the human potential. And society was ordered to maximize that. And America flourished and changed the world. And now we have a group of people in America who believe that that moment has passed. And America is no longer that country anymore and shouldn't be that country. And in fact, Europe has the better ideas. And they want to pass, when we hear you say, well, Barack Obama is a European socialist. Understand what that means. He believes in the model of the French Revolution. He believes in a secular, uh, government-run society. Freedom is top-down, not bottom-up. Now, I would make the argument that most Americans, most blue-collar Americans, don't believe in the progressive European socialist view of, of America. That's not where they are. They believe in faith. They understand the importance of it. They believe in work. They believe in responsibility. They believe in God-given rights. And they also would like to see America be economically prosperous for everybody, not just some. The problem with the Republicans is the Republicans agree with them on the, value issue, the values, the overall values, but we have not figured out a way to communicate our policies in connecting to those values. And that's what we attempt to do here in, in Blue Collar Conservatives, which is these are folks who agree with us on this fundamental question of what, where America is going. But they don't see Republicans as, frankly, giving a damn about them. Because if you listen to what Republican policies are on the economy in particular, you hear three things. Number one, balance the budget. Number two, cut taxes for high-income individuals. And number three, cut benefits for low-income individuals. Now, if you're part of the 80% who's not low income or the 1% high income, where are, you, where are you in that message? Where are they talking to you about, particularly if you're part of the 70% that don't have a college degree in America, where is the Republican mac macroeconomic message going to connect with you? And the, the bottom line, it doesn't. And so we have to start to be intentional about how our ideas connect to the problems that people are facing in America and that the values that they hold. In the book, um, you talk about the mythical Harrison family, composite family of people that you've met in the last few years. And they live in Ohio, which is a great thing. And we, I mentioned this on the radio because I think Senator Santorum is one of the few people who get it. And I get it because I'm from Warren, Ohio. And there are new jobs in Warren, Ohio for the first time in 40 years because a steel mill opened to do fracking piping. And first time in 40 years, and blue-collar conservatives, you talk about bringing manufacturing back. Nobody really believes that, but having read the book, you really do believe that. I have no doubt that it can happen, and it's essential for it to happen on a, on a variety of different levels. It can happen because we have to create, if we create a level playing field for manufacturing. I have, uh, the Wall Street Journal criticized this idea that I put one of, I have several ideas in the books on how to do it, but a couple of them. One they supported, which is, Energy. We got to we got to do everything we can to create as much energy and reduce the, the price of energy. That will of course create manufacturing jobs. It will also create energy jobs. But the manufacturing manufacturing in the energy industry. But it will also create other manufacturing jobs. Why? Because if you lower and stabilize energy prices, what's the biggest user of energy in the country? Well, it's manufacturing. It's very high intensive energy use. So if you lower that price, you make manufacturing more competitive. The problem with manufacturing in America is that we have Republicans on the wrong side. If you look at Walmart, Walmart competes against Target or Costco, right? Your law firm competes against the law firm down the street. Your accounting firm against the, the insurance company against the, the dental practice against the dental practice. The restaurant against the restaurant. Everybody competes, right? But that pipe making company in Warren, Ohio, who do they compete against? The Chinese, the Mexicans, it's international competition. It's very rarely anymore that they compete domestically. It's all international. Yet, we treat them the same in the tax code as if they were a, 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 you know, a dental company. And they're not. So what I'm saying is, well, let's look at what the real level playing field is. What's the level playing field? Is it against you know, the other American company? No, it's against the international competition. Let's assess it. And let's figure out what we can do to make sure that we can be competitive. And we don't do that. In, our, in, in my book, I list a whole bunch of things we can do, including eliminating the corporate tax for manufacturing. So we can be competitive. I'm not talking about labor costs, because our labor costs are going to be higher than they should be, and we want them to be, to be honest with you. 
but the rest of the costs have to be competitive. And we'll, we'll take the higher labor costs because we have a more efficient and better, better workforce. We're closer to market, a whole bunch of other reasons why there's, there's advantage to, to, to doing work here. So uh, manufacturing is important because it generates wealth. It creates something, makes things. And the multiplier effect of businesses that make things are far greater than any other business. Here's the other reason, and it's you. Warren, Ohio is a great example. I mean, I could give you a dozen cities in western Pennsylvania just like Warren, Ohio, where whatever the industry was, it left. And Warren, Ohio is, what, half the size it was when yep. you were going to there? Roughly the same thing with my hometown. In fact, if you look at small towns all over America, uh, in particularly in the, in the manufacturing sector of the country. It's all like that. And you know what? Did you ever look at a map of America politically and you look at Republican versus Democrat? All of those counties are what? What color are they? Red. 90% of the counties in America are red. I think it's like 90%. They have these really dark blue areas. And the problem is we're losing. Those little dark blue areas outvote all those red areas. Why? Because everybody's moved to the cities. Why? Because that's where the jobs are. But I see if you create manufacturing jobs, they're not in the city. They're in Warren, Ohio. And all of a sudden, Warren, Ohio starts to get life again. And then the communities in the rural areas, because you're now timbering and, lum and, 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 and drilling, and, and you have manufacturing jobs that are nearby in a small town, all of a sudden those rural areas start to come to life again. And all of a sudden you begin to create a shift, and those blue areas start to lose populations, and I, I happen to believe that there's something about living in a community where you interact with the land. Because whether you're a farmer, or whether you're in the, in the, in the energy industry, whatever it is, or just you're living out in a, in a more rural or suburban area. Living in areas where you see, where the change of seasons matters and what happens around you, what's, you interact with God's creation. You live in a city, you interact with man's creation. It's all you see is man's creation. And you lose something. You lose the sense of something bigger than you are because it's all just things that you can create. And so I think it's vitally important for us if we're going to be successful as a country to create opportunities outside the urban areas of America for us to get people back in touch with God and his creation. All right, before I go to this uh, lightning round of questions for you, and there are lots of good ones here, um, you have seven children, you have a wife of 24 years. Would you give us a rundown on how the Santorum family is doing from top to bottom and uh, what they're doing? Yeah, uh, my daughter Elizabeth is uh, just finished up another book. We just uh, handed in a manuscript this week. Uh, Elizabeth, Karen, and I have, are, are writing a book about our daughter Bella, and uh, that's coming out next spring. And we're really excited about having, having done that. Uh, our daughter, Bella, as you may recall, is uh, going to be six years old in about a little over a week. Uh, she is a little miracle. She has a, a disorder, a genetic disorder called trisomy 18, which is like Down syndrome. Down syndrome is trisomy 21. Only 18 is much more severe. Um, it has a, uh, trisomy 18 has a less than 1% survival rate for uh, as a, uh, up to a year. And so she's in the 0.001% of surviving, and she's uh, a miracle. Uh, but she is a, a great blessing to the family and had a huge impact, uh, has a huge impact on our family and um, had, frankly, a very big impact on the campaign, to be very honest with you, because we had to stop the campaign in the middle because she got very, very ill and almost died. And at the end of the campaign, that's one of the reasons we decided to wrap it up, because she got very sick again. And, uh, but she's been healthy and doing great. Uh, the rest of the family, I have two boys. Uh, a sophomore and a freshman at the Citadel, which is the Military College of South Carolina. Which, uh, and so they're, uh, they're cadets at the Citadel. Um, I have two, uh, three in junior high and high school. Sarah Maria is 16, and uh, Peter and Patrick are 14 and 12. And everybody's doing pretty well in school, remarkably. Take after their mom, and uh, <laughs> we're good. Now, I guarantee you, the first question here is about getting greater control of the presidential election process. How will the Republican Party get a fair election? rules, network sponsors, debates. I, I want to put it in this context. I think I know you pretty well. I watched the campaign pretty closely. I've interviewed you 30 times. I didn't know until tonight you were a nutty hockey fan. I mean, you're a nutty hockey fan. And he's in there watching this thing like it matters. And I'm, how many of you are hockey people? A couple okay. hockey people, okay. A few, few hockey people. How many Kings fans? How many Ducks fans? 
Oh, no, it's pretty. So how come America, this is a very serious question, how come America doesn't know you're a crazy hockey fan? Because that's actually the kind of stuff that gets people elected. <laughs> um, the media does a very good job of creating caricatures of, of people in public life. Uh, I remember um, when I first got elected, uh, they, you know, the media just did everything they could to paint me as this dangerous conservative. That's a, they, the lead editorial in the Philadelphia Inquirer when I ran for the United States Senate, uh, when they, when, the day before the election was, be afraid, be very afraid. That was the headline. Uh, and they called me a dangerous man. So now, it, it, but that's what they do. And, and, and then they, they, can, they continue to, to, to create uh, this persona that you are some out of touch, crazed, whatever, whatever the issue is. And that's how they do it. And, and so it's, uh, if you're a liberal, how many, have you ever read a paper, the LA Times, you ever read the LA Times when they describe a congressman and senator and they say the very liberal? Never. But you always see the ultra conservative or the incredibly conservative. They always put the moniker in front of the Republican. And they just, oh, you know, this guy could be, you know, left of Marx, and they'd say the Democrat from California, right? Doesn't matter. And, and, but that's what they do. It's, and it's all very subtle. And, and so the last thing they want to do is humanize you. I mean, the most common comment I get when I meet people, uh, and, and, and folks on the other side, people who hate me, and is, boy, you're nothing like I thought you would be. And, and uh, you know, I... Many times, you know, I'd run the campaign and we'd win, and I'd say, I just don't know how he did it. I mean, I wouldn't like me if I just read what I read about me. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't vote for me. Uh, but it's, it, it is, it's amazing. I, I, I have a lot of hope because it's amazing that conservatives do as well as we do in, in spite of what's going on out there. And it's, and it's not just the news media. It's, it's Hollywood. I, I've been, I've, we were keeping track during the campaign, but... Uh, I think I was mentioned in either TV shows, movies, sitcoms, whatever it is, uh, seven or eight times. Now, I'm not talking Saturday Night Live. That's, for, that's, that's free, you know, your, your free game there. But, uh, you know, just TV shows where they would throw in a reference to me. Uh, and, for example, uh, you may know the, the show Veronica Mars. You even know the show Veronica Mars? It's on USA Network. Uh, one of the shows of Veronica Mars was that there was a, uh, there was a, a someone outing gay kids at their school. And uh, so Veronica Mars was going to find out who this person was. Well, it turned out she, she found the kid who was outing it, and his name happened to be Rick Santorum. It's a common name. <laughs> uh, so, Very subtle. Yeah, very <laughs> subtle. And, you know, I had Tony Soprano talk about me in The Sopranos, and, uh, you know, and, and not the nice, not ways of, oh, I want my kids to hear but that's what they do. You pay a price for holding it. And so that's why a lot of members, a lot of politicians, just when it comes to particularly issues that, that they know get the left up in arms, they just back away. They get quiet about it because they don't want to be ostracized. Now, let me ask you about uh, being bitter or not being bitter. You won the Iowa caucus. And nobody knew you won the yeah. Iowa caucus. Yeah. So do you wake up at night some nights and think, Doggone it, I won the Iowa caucus, and I, no one said I won the Iowa caucus. It's a big deal. You know, I, I, one of the things I learned a long time ago, Hugh, is, you know, um, what I always, when I look at as failures, uh, God has turned into incredible successes. So I, I, don't, I don't worry about failure. I, I, I just take whatever comes, and I look at that and say, you know, had I won the Iowa caucuses, was I ready? Was my organization ready to really be the... Uh, uh, the lead candidate, I don't know. Maybe I wasn't. Maybe I wasn't ready. I, but I, I'll never know. Uh, but we didn't. We raised a little bit more money. I mean, we had. Well, I should say we raised a lot more money. I mean, I in Iowa, I was. Uh, I spent on television to win the Iowa caucuses. I spent thirty thousand dollars. Okay. I mean, you can run a. You can't run a city council race, you know, here in town for thirty thousand dollars. Uh, and we spent less than $2 million the entire year up to Iowa for the campaign. And, I mean, Romney spent $4.5 million on television, just to give you an idea in Iowa. So what, 
we did was really remarkable. And, and the fact that we lost by eight votes, I thought on election night that the story would be, hey, this guy who ran for, for president, and everybody laughed because the last time I ran for office was in 2006. And I lost by the largest margin of any incumbent senator in 30 years. And so four years later, of course, I decided to run for president. And, <laughs> and that was the reaction. Are you kidding me? They laughed. People laughed. Like, you, 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 are you kidding? Why, well, go run for you know, mayor or dog catcher. You know, get elected to something, then think about running. But I just felt like I was called to, and I wasn't worried about losing. I just felt like this was what I was called to do. And so when I, when I lost by eight, it, to me it was a victory. I, I thought the media would play it that way. Little did I know that within 24 hours, it might as well have been 8,000 votes because if Romney won, he was going to be the nominee because he was going to win New Hampshire. It was over. And the problem is that between New Hampshire and South Carolina, we got declared the winner, but nobody paid any attention at that point. And having said that, though, you know, two weeks later, we ended up winning three states that uh, no one saw us coming. Again, we sort of came out of the blue and won three, Colorado, Missouri, and Minnesota, and, and then we were already at the top of the heap again. So, uh, you know, and I think we were in better position, frankly, to, to take it on at that point. We had we'd gotten our, our sea legs a little bit. So now, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't look back. I just, I think it was a blessing one way or the other. There is a uh, story in Blue Collar Conservative, which I referenced on the radio, and I hope all of you listened today, but I'm going to have him retell it in, in the event you didn't quite understand it. Uh, when Senator Santorum got out of the race, he sat down with uh, Governor Romney's pollster, who told him one of the most interesting things I've seen about a crosstab, an internal in a poll. Uh, explain who was voting for you and when, Senator. Yeah, one of the, you, you, the book is Blue Collar Conservative, and one of the things we did in the campaign to differentiate ourselves was go out and really speak on the issues of energy and manufacturing. That was my mantra. I went up to the Bakken in North Dakota and had a piece of shale rock. If you ever, shale rock, where that oil comes from, looks like a piece of coal. You wouldn't, it's, a, it's a rock, and it's black rock. And believe it or not, under intense pressure, it leaches oil, right? It, you frack it, you crack it, and you... And you put this pressure in, and, and, and oil comes out of this stuff. And so I carried around a piece of, uh, you know, I carried around a clump of oil, and uh, you know, went to the Detroit Economic Club and put my clump of oil up there and said, you know, this is the key. And so we tra we did this in Iowa. We announced our manufacturing plan there. We did our energy plan, and like I said, in North Dakota and other places. And, and so we were out there talking about these things all the time, and the media was not picking it up because. Again, it's the caricature. Rick Santorum's the social conservative candidate. If you looked at the debate here at the Reagan Library, the debate, any of the debates, you'll find the same thing. I got asked every single social conservative question that was asked during the campaign. Every one of them. I remember there was a debate, it was a CNN debate, and they were doing questioners from all around the country. You know, they put up the question and, you know, oh, here's such and such from Jacksonville, Florida, and he asked a question for you. And so they'd, they'd ask the question, and then they'd say, okay, well, you know, you answer that one. And so I'll never forget, they had this guy with a U.S. Army shirt. He's up there, big, brawny guy, and he says, I'm such and such, and I'm a gay soldier. I said, okay, that's coming to me. I guarantee it. <laughs> and it did. And here's the other thing. I was the only one that got the question. They didn't ask anybody else. And so that's what they do, uh, particularly if you're, if, if you're a social conservative. So they, they, were, they wanted to create that caricature, and, and the reality was we were out there campaigning on other things. And... and and it was working. And, and what Hugh was talking about is that one, Michigan was the key. Michigan was the, uh, right after the three states that I won, Michigan and Arizona were next. And it was Rit Romney's home state, and we were neck and neck in Michigan. And he was spent, uh, he had spent me like eight to one in Michigan. Uh, and, and so we were driving the, econo the, the economic message really hard, blue collar message really hard up there. And on election night, uh, I think the exit polls at 5 o'clock had Romney winning by like 8 or 9 points. In the end, he won by less than 2. And so they said, well, what the heck was going on there? And then the next time, the same thing. Exit polls at 5 o'clock had us either, I think it was trailing and we ended up winning. And so they started to ask the question in their polls. You know, uh, who are you going to vote for and when are you planning to vote? And he showed me this poll from three days before I dropped out of the race from Pennsylvania, which was the next state in line before I dropped out. 
and he asked, and it said that if you voted, if you're planning to vote before five, uh, noon, I was ahead by five. Between noon and five o'clock, I was down four. After five o'clock, I was up by 21. And, it, and of course, it's the people coming home from work who can't take off during the day who are voting for us. And I make the point that, at least according to the numbers, six million blue-collar workers stayed home in this last election because they couldn't vote for Obama because they knew what he was doing to destroy their world, but they couldn't vote for someone who they perceived didn't care about them. And that's what happened. Uh, Senator, the, I'm going to merge this question with mine. Uh, what will it take for the Republicans to win the presidency in 2016? Uh, in last week's Weekly Standard, just went off um, the racks, I had an article about an open convention because the way I see this setting up right now, and I wrote it, so I'll just tell you, is I see Ted Cruz winning Iowa and South Carolina and sweeping all before him unless someone else figures out how to win and Rule 40 where you have to win majorities of eight delegations screwing up the Republican Party something terrible. I mean, the rule is just a nightmare. It is a nightmare. Uh, so I don't think we win with this crazy primary system we have. What do you think, and what do you think about the position of Senator Cruz, who, by the way, is probably trying to get your list. He probably wants everyone who voted for you in Iowa to come to dinner with him in Iowa. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I would say that the primary system is, is the, the, way it's, the way it's structured, is close to as good as we're probably going to get. Um, as you recall, I mean, uh, 50, before 50 years ago, primaries didn't matter because the political bosses picked the, the, the candidate at the convention, and it was all an inside job. In, in many respects, the Democratic Party still like that. They have all these super delegates, so uh, winning primaries is important for momentum and things like that. People underestimate the value of momentum. Uh, but, it, uh, but the political bosses still have a lot of sway in the, in the interest groups in the Democratic Party. It's not the case of the Republican Party. The Republican Party is much more democratic in the way it operates. And the fact that we start out with these five states, uh, four states, I should say, um, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada, uh, from regional primaries and smaller states, makes sense to me. It, uh, it creates an opportunity for someone like a Rick Santorum who resonates with people but doesn't have a lot of money because the establishment isn't for them, and therefore they don't have the resources, can actually get out there and, you know, hand-to-hand -hand comment, do what Barack Obama did. You know, convince people that they were a better candidate and, and, and launch them. And you could try to, you can change that, but I think that would be, uh, that would be a mistake. I, I don't, some people say, well, we should go to, you know, three or four, I mean, four or five regional primaries. Then you might as well just decide uh, right now that you're going to have an establishment Republican candidate who can raise money in New York and Los Angeles. Look, the money, here's the problem of the Republican Party. You want to know the problem of the Republican Party? The Democratic Party is perfectly aligned. The Democratic Party is a progressive, left-wing, hardcore, hardcore liberal party. And their funders are too. Soros, Gill, all those funders, everybody. If you look at the, the Democratic money givers, they are all in line with that progressive left-wing agenda. In fact, they may be farther left than the Democratic Party is. The Republican Party base is conservative. The activists and the, and, and the base of the Republican Party is down the line conservative, but our funders are not. Why? It goes back to that issue I was talking about earlier, the dark pack, patches of blue and the sea of red. Where is the money in America? Is it in rural California? Is it in rural Iowa? No. It's in the cities. And the cities are a very dangerous place for a conservative. Even, and I always said, when I ran for president, if I would go out into the cities and try to raise money, there was only two states in America where if you gave me money as the hardcore conservative that I was portray I'm portrayed to be, if you gave me money, you would pay a price at the club or among your peers or your friends or at your business for giving money to someone who is a fill in the blank, right? The only two cities where you don't pay a price are Houston and Dallas because the money in that town is primarily conservative. But everywhere else, 
it's hard for someone like me or Ted Cruz or, or, to raise money there because you pay a personal price for giving. And that's the problem of the party. Unless we can get the party aligned, then we're always going to have this battle. You, you, why do the Democrats, the media always talk about the Republican Party is always fractured? Well, the Democratic Party is not fractured because they're a monolith. There's no dissent. You're not allowed to dissent. They are completely in line. You, you, there is no dissension over there. On our side, it's always a, it's always a, a, a dissent because the base doesn't line up with the money. And I, how do you fix that? I don't, I don't know how you fix it. But if we continue along the lines of some people want to do, which is to change the primary system to go to regional primaries, then, then the money's going to control the Republican process. It already does, but, but having these small primaries and a longer primary season actually gives the conservative a chance to win. They haven't recently, but at least it gives them a chance to win. Uh, you were very diplomatic and didn't say about you and Ted Cruz's voters, so I'm going to go back and ask, aren't you looking for the same voter as Ted Cruz? No, I don't think so. Um, I think the... Uh, Ted has a little different persona than I do, and um, I think his his uh, the way his tactics and everything I think are just different than 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 I'm. I look. I, I think I appeal to to folks who are frankly more blue collar, more uh, uh, I mean, I, certainly more social conservative. I just don't think that's where Ted is heading. I think Ted is really more after more of a libertarian. I think his. I think he's going after Rand Paul's voters. I think I see Rand Paul and Ted Cruz sort of in their own primary. Um, Interesting. Half of these questions are about immigration. So rather than ask them, I'm just going to ask you, if you were the king of the world, not queen, not duke, not earl, what would you do with the 12 million people who are in this country illegally? Um, my father was an immigrant. Uh, he uh, came to this country in 1930. My grandfather came in 1923. Under the, uh, just, as the, just as the curtain was about to come down on Italian immigration. Uh, none of you are old enough to remember that. I'm not old enough to remember it. But back in the late teens, early 20s, there was a sentiment in America against Italians because there were so many had come over and were overrunning America. And, and so they passed laws to limit immigration to keep Italians out. And those laws went into effect at the end of 1923. So my grandfather came in a month before he wouldn't have been able to come in anymore. By doing so, um, he left his family behind, because that's for the rules. And because of the immigration laws, he had to wait seven years to see his dad uh, and to be reunited with his, with his, with his, with his wife and, and three children. Um, my dad always told me, because we told me that story, you know, the hardship of that, and then he ended up coming to America, and they lived in a company town, no running water, two rooms, uh, very poor. Uh, but he always talked about the greatness of America and that America was worth it. It was worth waiting, living there seven years without his dad. It was worth coming here, doing it the right way. And he had the opportunities that... You know, within a generation, his, you know, his grandson was running for president of the United States. And so when I, when I look at my own experience and I say, well, it's hard to do, to do right. If it was easy to do right, then, you know, everybody would do right. But it's hard to do right. But see, America, we want to reward right. We want to reward people who do the right thing and follow our laws and, and, uh, and respect the rule of law. And so I, I take the, the, um, the approach that I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to talk about immigration policy and what we need to do about our immigration policy, whether we need a guest worker program for the Central Valley, whether we need uh, to have uh, immigration at, um, for colleges and universities to allow more people with higher skills to be able to come in and stay with student visas and all. I'm happy to discuss all those things. Uh, but I'm not really willing to discuss the issue of the 12 million people until I'm convinced that the 12 million people is a 12 million people problem, not a 20 million people problem. And we've been promised for a long time that uh, our nation would, ha would have our borders secure. And I think it's in important for us to secure them to create a finite 
issue. And the finite issue is, okay, very few to no people are going to be coming over the border now that we've, we've, we've done what every president for four presidents, now or five presidents have promised to do. But if we do it, then I'm happy to talk and sit down with Democrats, Republicans. We can work out a bill. I have no doubt we can work out a bill once we have accomplished what I think is necessary, which is that if we fix the problem, we're not going to create another problem. And that's, that's, where, that's the biggest concern I have, is that if we, if we just go about and fixing it, we create another. And the final thing, I am not going to play the political game that the Democrats have embarked upon. Democrats do not want to fix this issue. They do not want to solve this problem. If they wanted to solve this problem, Barack Obama had two years with a supermajority in the Senate, a supermajority in the House. He could have passed any bill he wanted, and he never proposed one. So you can't tell me they're serious. I mean, I, I don't know any Hispanic in America who can look at Barack Obama and look at the opportunity he had to do whatever he wanted and did nothing, didn't even talk about it. And now it's all of a sudden Republicans are blocking everything. They're playing politics. You know the president is not a truth teller to begin with. And so all we, all we see is the game he's playing. So I'm not going to play that game. All right, now, I'm about to ask what if this was a mainstream media event would be a gotcha question. I'm going to talk to you about Donald Sterling in the event of the week. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to talk to you about that and give you a couple seconds to prepare, not an ambush. My friend Dennis Prager and I spent six hours on Tuesday talking about this, and Dennis and I deeply disagree about this issue. So conservatives can't. Dennis thinks this has been horribly and terribly handled and that it's been the triumph of PC. I wanted Sterling fired from the NBA that day. And so I'm just curious, and I don't, I'm not going to ask for your opinion on what the commissioner did so much as what you think the media would do with that if you were running for president right now. Do you, do you get what I'm at? This is the Republican problem. Dennis and I have six hours a day to talk about it, and we're not running for anything. But if you were on a stage with eight other Republicans running for president, you would be asked a gotcha question about uh, uh, the NBA and, and, the, and the comments of, of Sterling. How are you going to handle that? I mean, uh, I, mean I, I, I think in, in this case, I, I would just simply say the NBA, it's, the NBA is a private organization. What, what the man said was deplorable, and um, they sh should take appropriate action as they see fit, and I and personally supported what they did. Um, my only comment aside from that is, it seemed to me purely evident that the NBA knew what was going on with this guy for a long time and didn't do anything. And, and so that's, that raises the more serious question as to how did this guy get away from wave with it as long as he did. And that raises a larger question about the activities and, um, and the, uh, uh, the values that the NBA is, is purporting to, in, in to uh, share with America as to what is good and proper behavior, period. So. I think the NBA has a lot of work to do to clean up their act. That is a fascinating question, answer. And if it was a presidential debate, you would have had half the time and you wouldn't get a follow-up. So what I'm getting at, though, is not the particular question, is how do you ever get a chance when you run for president to have a serious conversation about issues like that? Newt pushed back in almost every debate by redefining the question. That only gets so far. I mean, you know, there's better yeah, than he, he wouldn't answer. He wouldn't answer, he wouldn't answer a question. Right? And, and so, is that the right way to go? Well, it's, it's the right way to go in, in some cases. Yes, it is the right way to go. Uh, because the media that heretofore, now the Republicans are trying to change this, but heretofore the media that was chosen for Republican debates is the equivalent of having Hugh Hewitt monitor, you know, monitor a Democratic debate. Because, you know, Brian Williams did the debate out here, and I mean, Brian's about as hostile to Republicans as anybody out there. And, and if you look at the series of questions he asked here at the Reagan Library, I mean, it was deplorable. It was horrible. And they were all gotcha and nasty. All, and he would never do that on the other side. And so uh, part of it is the Republican Party taking control of the debates to some degree, to the degree they can, in requiring moderators to be uh, moderators, not participants. Wrights has already told me I get to moderate one. Yeah, he has. So, so I'm going to tell you my first question. 
If you're running and I get to do this, I'm going to ask you, should we be caring more than we are about the nuclear deterrent and what President Obama is doing to it? Yeah, I actually write a lot about this, um, whether it was START II treaty, uh, whether it is uh, what's going on with, uh, with Iran, uh, the proliferation that's going to happen if Iran does get a nuclear weapon, which I think is, I, mean, I think Iran is very, very close already. Uh, I don't know whether we're going to see an explosion. I, I'm not sure that they would necessarily do that right now, but I think they want the capability to go nuclear when uh, at, at some point, and, they, and once they reach the technical capability, it's just a matter of doing it at that point. Uh, somehow we have to stop them from doing that, because if once that moment happens, then you're going to see then you, the Saudis, the Turks, everybody. The, the whole Middle East is going to become a, a huge nuclear zone, and these are not the most stable regimes, and they're not the most stable ideologies running those machines, regimes. So uh, it's, it's a serious problem that the president has completely taken his eye off the ball. I mean, going out and negotiating a deal with the Russians to, to reduce nuclear weapons in America is somehow going to make the world safer. Um, and, and, of course, he reduced the weapons far more on our side than he did on their side. I think they have like a 10 to 1 advantage now in tactical nuclear weapons. And, and we agreed to that. And now we have to get approval of Russians, you know, to, uh, to, to, uh, to do anything on, on any kind of nuclear reduction. This, it's a really bad, <laughs> any kind of uh, uh, programs to improve our nuclear arsenal. We have to get approval of the Russians. So uh, this president has created on every front a more dangerous situation for America from a national security point of view. And, and none probably more dangerous than what he's done on the nuclear side, both by allowing Iran to develop a nuclear weapon and the consequence of that, and by putting Russia in a superior position to us vis-a-vis -vis nuclear weapons. What do you think President Putin's opinion of President Obama is? I don't know how anyone's going to tweet that answer, <laughs> but if you do, it's at Rick Santorum. Um, minimum wage versus incentive for fair wages. Part-time, skill level, low education requirements are not meant to support family and home ownership. However, if there's long-time, full-time employees are having to pay more, this is a very long question. I am not in favor of the minimum wage, but really, what do we do about it? Yeah, this comes down to, look, I. I come, again, you know my roots. Um, I've supported a minimum wage in the past, and we have to, what I, when I hear the debate on minimum wage from the Republicans, what I hear is an argument against a minimum wage. I'm not hearing an argument against increasing the minimum wage. What you hear is an argument against the minimum wage. Now, that's not what they say, but the arguments they're using really are arguments against a minimum wage period. And, and so the answer is, there's never a time to increase it. If you talk to any Republican, and the, and, and the reason he gives not right now not to increase it, you can make that out next year, the year after, that any increase in the minimum wage is going to cause people to be out of work, and therefore we shouldn't do it. Well, then you reach the point where, then why have a minimum wage? But no Republican will say, I'm against the minimum wage. No, politi politically, do you realize that minimum wage, is like 80% of Americans support the minimum wage? Mo most Republicans support the minimum wage. So, I mean, this is a case, in my opinion, where Republicans just are out of touch. And, and just, well, of course we should be for a minimum wage. Uh, it's something that is ingrained, that it's something we, that people believe is fair. But we need to look at it from the standpoint of, well, what's the impact on the economy? What's the impact on labor, on workers? And, and so what I've done is look back, when I was in the Senate, I look back historically, the minimum wage has averaged uh, around uh, when it was renewed, when it was increased. It was generally increased to about to cover 7 to 9 percent of workers' salaries. So if you look at all the workers' incomes, the minimum wage would cover 7 to 9 percent of workers. Okay? Uh, right now it covers less than 2 percent of workers. And so you can say, well, good. Uh, leave it there, or let it go down to 1%, let it go down to zero. Well, then you don't have a minimum wage. 
And so what Obama's doing is he's taking it and it's going to cover like 15% of workers or 20%. We're, that's not a minimum wage. That's a, that's, that's a government-imposed living wage. And so we can be opposed to that. And we should be opposed to that. And we should explain why we're opposed to that. Because not only will it cost jobs, but any increase in minimum wage will cost some jobs. But what it will do, the, the ripple effect in driving up the cost of labor to the point where, more, where massive amounts of people will become unemployed. But what we need to say is, look, I'm, I'm willing, when the minimum wage drops below a certain level, to bring it back up to 6 7% of the workforce, and then, you know, take a look at it and fight for it, see, see the impact on that. To me, that's sort of a reasonable approach. It's not going to have an inflationary impact. You can make sure that it's, again, as small enough increments as you know, California, the minimum wage is already higher out here, and so, so lifting the, the, the national minimum wage is not going to have that much of an impact here. It'll have the impact in, in places where wages are actually fairly depressed, and which is primarily in the South uh, and the Midwest. But it's not, it, it, to me, it's not an issue we should fall on our sword. It's an issue that shows that, again, to blue-collar conservatives, that you don't care about them. And you can say, well, they don't understand they may lose jobs. Well, yeah, but you know, sometimes they're saying, well, maybe it's a job I'm willing to lose to try to find another job that pays better. And that's, that's sort of where they are. And so I'm, I'm of the opinion we should support, we should propose a minimum wage that gradually increases it back to that level and then leave it there. I, I've got the very best question in this, but I want to ask one of those that Republicans don't get it. Republicans are always against funding stadiums for professional teams. They're always against it. They're yeah. always wrong because they don't understand. What, I, I was for it. You, you were, it, it. Would you explain to them why we have to be for that? Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> there was a paper in my, in my, uh, in my city, uh, Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, which is a conservative paper that hates me uh, because, uh, because I supported building the uh, PNC Park. And... Um, and went out and actually... Even argued. when you didn't have a professional football team in Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Just wait until the 70s. I know what he's going to say. Just, yeah. Seven Super Bowls, right? I think there's only... Uh, in Cleveland, let me see. Um, Get back to that tax so. thing. <laughs> Oh, the question. Oh, the PNC Park. Yeah, and and so I I actually supported a, a local initiative to to raise money to keep the Pirates in Pittsburgh because uh, I felt it was for for a city like Pittsburgh in particular, given the economic maelstrom that it had been through, uh, one of the things that allowed us to keep a lot of the corporate headquarters we had and a lot of the jobs that we have was that we were a first class city that had these amenities, and cities have to have amenities. I mean, that's that's sort of a there has to be entertainment. There has to be things. That's just the reality of the situation. That you know, Pittsburgh is if it's not a major league city, that's a big blow. You know, we become Columbus, right? Or you know, oh, uh, oh, oh. I, so we're going to Columbus next week. Oh, I, I, yeah. can, we, can we snip that part of the tape? Yeah, we're we're going to be. No, I mean, I mean, how many? Let, let's be all, be serious. I mean, how many of you know where Columbus, Ohio is? I mean, how, I mean, how many? And I but. But that's, that's my point. I mean, I, I, say, I don't say that to, because I'm sure Columbus would love to have a major league team. Yeah, they would. Columbus, Ohio is bigger than Pittsburgh. You know, Pittsburgh's not a big city at all. And so I'm, I'm just saying that that, to me, was an important part of keeping that tradition. And so it was, uh, but again, one of the things that drives me crazy about, about some Republicans is they're against any government. I mean, we're supposed to say, well, we shouldn't do something at the federal level. Don't, so do it at the local level. No, we're against it there too. Well, then you, see, you expect the private sector to do everything about roads, bridges. I mean, we can't be against all government, right? There's, there is a proper role for government to do some things for public infrastructure and, public and for the public good. And it should be done at the local level, not at the national or state level. I agree with that. But, but we can't oppose everything. And I think that sometimes we get ourselves trapped in that, in that box. Best question in here. Is Chris Christie a blue-collar Republican? I, I think he, I, look, I think he relates well to, to blue-collar uh, folks, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's got the Jersey thing going, you know. So, yeah, I think he, I think he relates well because he, 
his, his demeanor would be one thing, but I, he also somewhat, look, why was Reagan such a great president? You can say, well, he had great policies. You know, his policies were, were, were good. He had good policies and he stuck to them, and that clearly made him great. The fact that he had the courage to stick to the policies. But was, were, were his policies that revolutionary great? You could say yes to some degree, but you know what? He didn't get a lot of his policies done, right? He got some of them, but a lot of them he didn't. But what made him great? What made him so popular? What made him transform the country? He's a great communicator. If you look at every presidential candidate since the age of television, the winning candidate had one thing in common. Every one of them. They were the better communicator of the two. Every single one of them. And you could go into back to where you had two terrible communicators. You know, George H.W. Bush, a horrible communicator, but better than Michael Dukakis. <laughs> right? And you can look at his son, George W. Not a, I don't think George W., frankly, was a particularly good communicator. But Al Gore and, you know, <laughs> John Kerry, I mean, come on. So it's really important for us to think about how America, how you, I mean, look, all of you have these things, right? I'm surprised half of you aren't doing this right now, but we all are folks who, who receive our information in a very different way than they did politically 100 years ago or 50 years ago. It's now the ability to relate to people, right? Unfortunately, America is less, I, I don't know which is left brain or right brain, but we're, we're less one or the other. We're, we're less reason and ration and more feelings and emotion. And one of the beautiful things about Ronald Reagan is he could tell a story and relate to people. And one of the things in this book, I have a lot, there's a lot of stories in this book. Why? Because who's the greatest leader in the history of the world? Who's the greatest leader in the history of the world? Jesus Christ. And what did he do? Did he get up, did he get up and, and, and preach and, and say, okay, you, I want you to do this and this and this and this. And if you do this, let me show you this pie chart, how this will all work. And I've got a line graph that shows how economic growth will be created. No. He told stories. That's how people learn. That's how pe and you relate to people in a way that's very different. You show that you have a common footing. We have to understand that America is a very different place than what it was, again, 50 years ago. And that the key that Reagan had was be able to relate to people. And so I would say when it comes to a candidate for president, or even a candidate you know, for, for governor or something like that, to have someone that, that can come across in a way that, connect, that people connect with is one of the things that none of the establishment will ever tell you to do. They're always going to say, oh, it's a checklist of issues. And that if people believe, if people have these certain positions, they can't win. False. False. Absolutely, positively false when it comes to running for president. Because that's not why people vote for president. They don't vote for president. Do you vote for president based on a checklist of issues? There may be some of you who are hardcore conservatives who would. Sure. But that's, a, that's not the people who decide elections in America. The people who decide elections in America are not the hardcore left or the hardcore right. And the people in the middle, oh, we have to soften up our issues to appeal to them. They're in the middle. They don't care about those issues. That's why they're in the middle. <laughs> the people in the middle care about things that for them are just as important, and by the way, they're important to you, except they're low importance because you have passion about your issues. But they're important to you too. How about, is he someone who I trust? Someone who's authentic? Someone who has good character? Someone who cares about people like me? Someone who relates to people like me? Someone who can handle a crisis? But these are characters that people look at, and they should. Because the issues this year, or four years from now, when the president's in his fourth year, could be completely different. And so they're looking for qualities. And so don't listen to these pundits who say, well, we have to do, we have to change our position on these issues in order to win. 
That is a lie of people who don't believe those positions in the first place and are trying to get you to abandon them because that's what they want. We need to find folks who are willing to lead, who have the ability to grab the spirit of America and communicate that to the American public. And if we do, we're going to win this election. A few phrases which I'd like you to, to connect to a story. 9-11, um, Abu Ghraib, war-weary, Benghazi, Karzai. What's the story you're going to tell about America and the world to a blue-collar conservative about what they ought to be doing with that picture set in the background? Well, I think one of the things we have, we have to do is admit where we didn't do well for America. Um, I mean, one of the areas I, you know, I look at Iraq right now, and in, in my opinion, in, in the end, Iraq's been a failure. Um, Iraq is an unstable country. It's, it's heading in the wrong direction. It's much more tied to Iran. There's all sorts of violence. There's insurgencies. There's radical Islamists propagating in that country. Um, uh, you can point to a lot of reasons why it headed that way, and you can certainly blame, frankly, both presidents. Uh, but I think we have to look back and say uh, we had better learned a lesson from involving ourselves in a country like that. Um, you know, even at the time, I mean, if you go back to the time that we had to make that decision, I felt I made the right decision. Uh, but we had never been involved in a country in that region of the world to the extent that we were planning to in Iraq. And, I th and hopefully we learned some lessons about uh, our ability to influence particularly radical Islamic cultures. Um, I think we've also learned some things subsequent in Syria and Egypt um, and that could be helpful to us. The fact that the Egyptian government now is not a radical Islamic government, in spite of the fact that this administration supported a radical Islamic government, um, shows you that radical Islam in some areas of the Middle East, I would say five years ago, radical Islam in the Middle East generally was on the rise and had been for 30 years. That's not the case anymore. Uh, they had their opportunity in, in Egypt. Radical Islam took control, again, with the support of the Obama administration. And the Egyptian people rose up and threw, threw them out. And radical Islam is not on the rise in Egypt anymore. They had a taste of it, they didn't like it, and they got rid of it. And by the way, Barack Obama still wants to put them back in charge. I mean, figure that one out. But the Egyptians don't want anything to do with it. Uh, Yet, you, you know, you look in other areas, that's not the case. Look at what's going on in, in Turkey. Turkey is heading in the wrong direction. And again, the president's sitting on the sideline doing nothing. So you, there, there's, some, there's some things we can look at, and we, we, have, to, we have to look at the nuances of, uh, of, uh, of the areas that we're in and be more realistic in how we approach these endeavors, particularly in the Middle East. Uh, and so I would say to a, to a blue-collar conservative, uh, radical Islam is still an issue and a concern for America, particularly in certain countries in the world, Iran being one of them, uh, and that we need to be vigilant there. Uh, but in other areas, I think there are more effective tools for us to use than, uh, than, than some of the more aggressive actions that we've taken in the past. And my last question is, is a two-parter, and I want to let everyone know uh, Senator Santorum has a flight out of LAX tonight, so we're going to exit stage right in a hurry. He's not being rude, but he's making the, to the flight, uh, and I'll let you give him sustained applause. But the, <laughs> the interesting question is, what was the toughest moment in the debates in 2012 to which I'm going to append? Are you also looking forward to doing them again <laughs> if you do them in 2016? Um, there were a couple, I, mean, I would say the two... Uh, two tough moments. One was early in the debates and one was at the last debate. Uh, early in the debates, I was that candidate off to the far right. You know, at some, sometimes I thought I was like at the kids' table off the stage. Uh, 
And I would get, you know, they'd throw me one or two questions. It wasn't, I think it was the 18th of 22 debates that I got a question on healthcare. Uh, I got all the questions that they wanted to do to, you know, continue to sort of marginalize me as a candidate. It was very frustrating. Uh, and uh, throughout, after the first several debates, I unfortunately allowed that frustration to, uh, to show through. I mean, in two ways. Number one, when I did get a question, I would answer it like the guy that used to do the FedEx commercials. Uh, if those of you who are old enough to remember that, the speed talker, you know, and because I figured I only had a minute and I had to answer three questions in one because that was the only chance I was going to get. So, of course, I just rushed through the answer and I uh, didn't feel like I was doing a good job. And I was, you know, just, well, let me just put it this way. One of the debates, it's like this eighth or ninth debate, uh, I got the question and I wasn't, clearly wasn't happy that I was asked the question and so I got a little pissy. And uh, anyway, there was a break. You know, these debates, they have, you know, three or four minute commercial breaks during the debate. And during that time, I don't know if, if you've never attended it, you know, the candidates go and go powder your nose or go to the bathroom or most of the time what I did is I would go down and, you know, my family was there and I would go down in the, in the crowd and, and talk to my wife or my kids. And uh, I'd given one of those answers right before the break and um, I walked over and I saw my wife making a beeline to the stage. And she walked up to me and she got in my face <laughs> and she said, chill. <laughs> so that was sort of a turning point in the campaign for me. <laughs> and she, uh, to borrow a term from Mike Gallagher, who everybody knows, uh, uh, she said, you need to be the happy warrior. And if there's anything I would say to conservatives is we, and you know, look, I mean, here we are at Reagan. I mean, he was the happy warrior. People don't want someone who's going to, you know, going to bark at them and is going to be intense. They look at they, someone that is comfortable in their skin and, and can communicate that message. I mean, you know, show the passion when necessary, and it's good to show that passion. But, um, you know, understand that there's, there's an important part of just relational uh, of, of being upbeat about America, upbeat about the fight and, and the battles ahead. Uh, the second hardest thing was last debate. Uh, I'd been out there on the far end, and then I won these three states. And all of a sudden, I was leading the national polls. You know, I was the favorite. Uh, and all of a sudden, I was in the middle. So I went from the far end, and I'm now in the middle. And I felt like I was in a tennis match. Uh, just like, boom. Boom, I was just getting hammered, boom, boom. I mean, it was Mitt Romney on one side and Ron Paul on the other side. And it was like, I felt like, you know, a cricket bat. Boom, boom, back, back and forth. And I was sort of expecting it, but I have to admit, I, I don't think I expected it as much as, as it happened. And, uh, you know, you, it's a learning experience to have that happen to you. And I, I did okay. Uh, my wife would probably say, differently, uh, but I didn't, I didn't do as well as I should have, and I missed an opportunity. And, uh, and so I, that, to me, if you, if you think about, well, you want to come back, and the, I guess when you, and that was the last debate of the campaign, uh, when you sort of end on that note, there's, uh, you know, it's, it's like losing the seventh game, right? You can't wait for spring training, right? You got to get, you, got, you want to get back there and say, you know, look, I, okay, I get it now. I know, I know what the pressure's like, I know what the feeling is, I know how to deal with this. And I will tell you, I, I say this all the time, and I mean this in all sincerity, I really do mean this in all sincerity, everybody should run for President of the United States. Because uh, it is an amazing experience. It, to, to learn this country and to, and to interact with people from all over the country and, and see the greatness and the goodness of the people of America, it is uplifting, it is grueling, it is hard, and yet it is so rewarding. And so I, I do encourage people. But at the same time, uh, I caution you that, you know, don't try this at home. Because yeah. uh, <laughs> it is not an easy thing to do. I mean, it's, it is not easy. Every day is, is uh, you know, is a battle. I mean, it's a real battle out there. And 
you got folks coming at you every single day. And if you're in a multiple candidate primary, they're coming at you from all over the place every single day. And, uh, and you, have to, you have to have the temperament and you have to have the, uh, the confidence in yourself. I mean, you know, I know everybody that runs for president, you don't want to elect them because they're so arrogant to think that they could be president, right? I mean, who, who do you want? How many people think they can be president? I mean, you got to be, you have to sort of have, oh, I can be president. Ah, oh, arrogant guy, what is he going to be president, right? So, so, of course, I mean, there's an immediate suspicion of anybody who thinks they can be president, right? And, and, but at the same time, you have to have that. You have to have that sense of, you know, of confidence that you can, you can take on that responsibility and do it. And you want someone who is comfortable in that position. You don't want someone who's overwhelmed by the experience. I mean, Reagan was able to accomplish that better than others with his humility, but there was a, there was a steeled confidence that this man knew who he was and, and was comfortable in his skin. And you need that in a president. You need that who can, who's, who's comfortable with who he is and is not going to be shaken by the events that the world will throw at them. Uh, because if they see someone, as we've seen, if they see someone who is shakable, the world will shake. And that's what's happening right now. I mean, uh, you folks in California know what it's like when the world shakes. And, <laughs> and, and as, a, as, a, as an analogy, that's what's happening in America today. The world is shaking America. And because they know this president is shakable. They know this president is unsteady. And, and, and as a result, America is, a, a influence around the world is crumbling with our allies who don't trust us and our enemies who don't respect us, much less fear us. And my big concern is how we make it for the next two years and what the world will look like in two years for the next president. I think you're going to be surprised to see that national security interests are going to be as important an issue, maybe even more important an issue. And so when you look at candidates, one of the things you need to look at is, you know, how is that person going to be able to deal with the world stage to reestablish American credibility? And uh, because that's going to be the big order of the day. We're going to have to recommit ourselves to our allies, start building alliances that are real again, and start confronting evil in a way that, uh, that the left does not believe exists. See, I believe evil exists. I know it exists. And so we have, to, we have to have someone who understands that and is willing to confront it. I would like to uh, begin uh, my thanks by saying at the conclusion of this, please visit our sponsors without whom we could not have brought Rick Santorum out here today. And they are wonderful, wonderful people. Also want to, uh, I want to thank our friends from KRLA, the amazing event staff. Uh, and if you would just stand up, if you're KRLA people, let us thank you. You did a great job, Pamela and Terry and all the rest of you. The Reagan Library all, always does a great thing. They gave uh, Senator Santorum and I these wonderful nice. jackets. And uh, they're going to Columbus next week. And then finally, Please join me in thanking, though he has an obvious Ohio problem, which we'll fix next week, Senator Rick Santorum. Good night. Oh, great.